Chapter 4 Law of the Universe Our Moral Obligation to Obtain Our Desires Quote What is success? I think it is a mixture of having a flair for the thing you are doing, knowing that it is not enough that you have got to have hard work and a certain sense of purpose. End quote by Margaret Thatcher. Quote The desire that guides me in all I do is the desire to harness the forces of nature to the service of mankind, end quote, by Nikola Tesla. I believe these two quotes illustrate the basis and foundation for true success, knowing that we wake up excited for a day because what we do puts a fire within us, that we wake up with energy and vigor because we love what we do, Realizing that long hours of work are a pleasure because they give us energy and serving others will certainly give us purpose. Knowing that our personal desires harness the forces of nature for the betterment of ourselves and others will expand the universe into a universal paradise. We must realize that essentially this is not philosophy, but it is physics and connection to the power of our mind. This is precisely what will be proven in this chapter. We will examine why doubt and disbelief will kill us, literally, but faith and knowing us will give us biological eternity. This may sound bizarre, but let's consider some texts in the biblical reference that emphasize these governing laws of the universe. As mentioned before, we will examine these ideas in the light of quantum physics and other quotes from a world-renowned scientist who has been considered to be a genius and possibly the greatest inventor of all time. Examining these statements and ideas in the light of the four scientific principles we discussed on the previous chapter will give us the assurance that biological eternity is not as far-fetched as we might think. As such, we will build a foundation with the following text. Quote, Faith is a sure expectation of what is hoped for, the evident demonstration of realities that are not seen. End quote. Taken from Hebrews 11 verse 1. Quote, Indeed, everything that is not based on faith is sin. End quote. Taken from Romans chapter 14 verse 23. It is of utmost importance that it is emphasized in the reader's mind that this is not theology or religious philosophy by definition. The statements here are not a preachy sermon that presents human beings as all evil and destined to burn in some hellfire or anything of that sort. The word sin, by definition, is really a misnomer. In essence, what is described in the Bible as sin is not what most people think, but far from it. The reasons? They are irrelevant, and they do not belong in this context. They will not be discussed. It will just be a waste of time. With all this in mind, consider the exact definitions and elaborations on the words faith and sin. The Bible is describing the power of the mind and its mechanics by definition. But to illustrate faith, consider that the person who works out his muscles will experience pain the more intense the workout. The physiology of the body is programmed to repair the muscles that tore apart during the workout and thus create new, stronger muscle tissue. The workout will progressively make a person stronger and more tolerant to pain and future workouts. This is why a bodybuilder must intensify his workouts to become stronger and more defined. Otherwise, they plateau. In a similar manner, faith denotes the action in which we exercise our brain muscles. The brain does need to be exercised. It needs stimulation the way we need to drink water and eat food to continue living. We either progress or regress. We are either growing or dying. There is no middle ground. By definition, the person who exercises his power of perception based on faith whether consciously or subconsciously, is exercising a muscle that will continue to get stronger. The person of faith, 
creates a decision in his mind to achieve something. He plainly sets an imprint in his mind of a desired outcome, a picture, and continues to hope for it. He thinks about it as much as he can with hope or the assured expectation of it. Hope is defined as, quote, a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen, end quote. Then fate must be defined as a feeling of knowingness that the expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen will absolutely happen. So by definition, this is law, not philosophy, not theology, or religious belief, but a law based on the fabric of the physical universe in relation to us and how we vibrate. So according to the four principles of science, let's reason and see what is happening at a quantum level. The person exercising faith for a desired result is sending a frequency of energy that is programming his entire persona and his reality. His consistency of broadcast through the principle that we become or we get what we think about most of the time begins to shift and influence his immediate reality. He cannot see it immediately. Therefore, he's experiencing the law of faith, the evident demonstration of things not seen. His knowingness and positive and strong desire for his desired result adds to the power of his neurons and is creating a powerful magnetic pool, and the person is drawing in everything that must take place so that the result is exactly what he decided must happen. In actuality, such person gets what he wants, exactly the way he pictured it from the start of the process. Through this process, the person will see his thoughts expand positively. Words will reflect person's positive expectation. Feelings motivate the person to take positive action, thus creating successful habits that help such a person persevere with his actions. The massive amount of energy that is being persistently generated at a quantum physical level is permeating the entire existence of such a person. It brings the person, the circumstances, events, People and situations that are drawing the dream closer or making him match the frequency of what was already created on the infinite realm of possibilities, the etheric field of energy. Thus, from the point when the decision for the dream or desired outcome was made, that dream or goal already existed on the field of quantum particle wave duality or the ether. This is quantum tunneling. Remember the particles that were being shot against the barrier? The particles decide to go through the wall regardless of their force and inertia because they already were on the other side of the wall. Our dreams, our desires already exist in the ether. Ether here is defined as the field of energy where all the particles of mass exist as waves and have wave-like qualities. They are energy, waves not tied into time and space, or defined by such concepts. A more precise definition of ether in physics is, quote, a very rare field and highly elastic substance formerly believed to permeate all space, including the interstices between the particles of matter and the medium whose vibrations constituted light and other electromagnetic radiation, end quote. It is emphasized that the ether and all the particles in waveform are not the same, but that one is a result of the other. But it will be used as parallel to describe where all creative decisions reside as a probability of existence. Thus, the ether and particle wave duality are closely related, although not the same. For illustrative purposes, it is encouraged for the reader to watch the Matrix trilogy film and directed by the Wachowskis. Many of these principles are clearly defined throughout the movies. It helps the movie viewer to understand through illustration what is the ether or the matrix. Quote, The same inexorable agents which prevent a mass from changing suddenly, its velocity will likewise resist the force of the new knowledge 
until time gradually modifies human thought, end quote, by Nikola Tesla. This quote gives a tremendous amount of data on drawing powerful conclusions in connection to our ability to create what we desire based on a brain transmission of frequency. In this instance, we choose and decide what we want, and that decision is created in an instant in time in the field of energy or the ether. Our thoughts are consistently changing the channel and thus initiating the process of bringing it into a defined collection of energy of particles in time and space, or our present matrix reality. Tesla described it here as agents that prevent a mass from changing suddenly. If you decide that you want $10 million, these agents prevent you from making it happen suddenly or instantaneously. This is good, and we can illustrate the reason this way. Imagine a man who finds a magical tree which fruit growth is based on people's desires. When the trees approach, it mirrors instantly what a person creates in his mind. He says to the tree, I am rich and wealthy. Immediately, he is surrounded with hundreds of millions of cash at his disposal. He then says, I want a gorgeous wife who loves me. Immediately, the most beautiful woman appears in front of him, ready to demonstrate her love for him. He then says, I desire eternal youth. And thus he feels invigorated with energy and power, and his complexion changes to that of a 25-year-old. He looks at everything and realizes that he has everything he could ever want. And he says, wow, this must be a dream. I must have died and gone to heaven. And thus, everything he asks for begins to disappear, and then he dies and goes to heaven. The point is clear. We don't always think or say positive things. In reality, we live in a very pessimistic and negative society. Imagine if you were in a zoo and saw a big, scary lion. Sometimes we wonder what would happen to us if the lion were not caged. Certainly, we don't want our negative thoughts to manifest physically in that instant. The key is that the new knowledge or broadcast of the desired result must be exercised persistently so the energetic transmission reaches the tipping point. When that occurs, there will absolutely be no choice but for us to have what we have asked, period. Faith has always been described as a spiritual belief, religious stubbornness, or dogma. If the reader is confused about the validity of the comment made that faith is a physical law, consider this biblical text. Quote, Where then is the boasting? There is no place for it. Through what law? That of works? No, indeed, but through the law of faith. End quote. Taken from Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Here in these texts, the biblical reference is again plainly demonstrated to have validity in a reliable source among ancient writings. Another statement ahead of its time, or maybe not ahead of its time. We may have just regressed a little, probably. The opposite of faith is fear. This sentence relates to the word sin which we will now break down even more. A person of faith pictures a desired result and knows without a doubt it will happen. The person of faith at least exercises faith so that even if he has doubts, he persists because of the strong desire. A person who exercises fear is in the ha habit of thinking about and talking about what they don't want to happen. The opposite of faith is fear. People who are in fear are generally mostly negative. The passage from scripture that says that anything that does not originate from faith is sin is, in essence, describing the same exact thing, fear. It has been said that fear is just an acronym for false expectations appearing real. I heard a successful life coach and successful businessman by the name of Ed Foreman talk extensively about this concept and the ramifications it creates in a person's life for entertaining such thoughts in their minds. By the way, he was elected to Congress at two different times for two different states. He's also incredibly wealthy 
according to many reliable sources. This also denotes the idea that every form of thought or action, every form of vibrational frequency broadcasted from your brain, it's either positive or negative. There is no neutral ground, no fence which one could straddle between both realms. We are either successful in creating a reality based on what we want or successful in creating a reality based on what we don't want. This will be determined based on our thinking habits and patterns of behavior, period. Thinking about Moses, do we not realize how important it is that we listen to people who have the physical manifestations that prove that what they are saying has basis in empirical evidence? It is important that through our power of discernment, we become observing people who have successfully transferred their dreams and goals from the field of energetic waves and particles of infinite possibility to the more defined world of energy in time and space. Or do we observe people who generally have lives which manifest their doubts and fears? And more importantly, do we take counsel from them? It is the desire now to also establish another point that we have previously mentioned. It is our moral obligation to create our dreams and think about what we want. Otherwise, we are creating the opposite, what we don't want. It has been shown in the field of healthcare that stress is the number one cause of illness and disease, which leads to death. People are tired and sick exhausted because the body is in a state of constant survival. The excess adrenaline and hormones that are being pumped through the body to help each person just bear his own existence obviously saps the body of strength and vigor. Thus, the body becomes prone to illness and disease. Stress does eventually kill us. This has been the sad destiny of all humankind since the beginning. It is funny how the biblical reference alludes to the idea of sin in connection with death. For it does say that the wages that sin pays is death. Also think of the placebo and the nocebo effect. This is established medical and scientific fact and is considered strongly every time a new drug or treatment is created to treat illness and disease. Placebo is defined as a harmless pill medicine, or procedure prescribed more for the psychological benefit to the patient than for any physiological effect. In testing, a group of people will be told that a certain drug or treatment will be given to them to treat an illness or disease that they have. Half will be given the actual drug, and the other half will be given a placebo in the form of a sugar pill. Many times those who take the sugar pills will be cured or made better more readily than the drug which was specifically designed to help them. By observation, it is their belief that cures them even though they took a sugar pill. Let's now consider the nocebo effect. A definition for nocebo is, quote, a detrimental effect on health produced by psychological or psychosomatic factors such as negative expectation of treatment or prognosis, end quote. In this scenario, fear of the substance or imagined negative consequence will make the body react exactly how the person was expected, negatively, but does not happen as a result of the thing itself that is fear. The point must be firmly established. It seems obvious that just because we decide to think positively all the time and follow our dreams and passions, it does not guarantee that we are going to stay alive and never die. But here's another plausible idea. If we think positively about life in the context of the following quote by Nikola Tesla, which was previously partially quoted, by law then, it is what exactly must happen. Quote, if the genius of invention were to reveal tomorrow the secret of immortality, of eternal beauty and youth, for which all humanity is aching, the same inexorable agents which prevent a mass from changing suddenly, 
its velocity will likewise resist the force of the new knowledge until time gradually modifies human thought. End quote. Here, Nicola is emphasizing that the thought itself, that of immortality, eternal beauty, and youth, is possible as long as people believe in its probability. Most people accept death as natural reality and a process of life, and as such it is our present reality. These thought processes that have established our current reality are the inexorable agents which prevent the particles from changing suddenly. But it is new knowledge that is persistently introduced into the whole mass that will change such reality. What knowledge will eventually and gradually modify the collective consciousness agreement of death? Consider the following scriptural reference that parallels Tesla's comment. Quote, For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but powerful by God for overturning strongly entrenched things. For we are overturning reasonings, and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we are bringing it into captivity to make it obedient to Christ. End quote. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. The weapons of warfare is referred to knowledge of the universe itself. The knowledge of how creation works will help us remove or overturn strongly entrenched things. The inexorable agents that Nikola Tesla described will be modified by new knowledge. For the proper recognition of the basic laws of the universe and how they relate to our personal and collective lives will enforce a new creative shift of thought in our minds. Interestingly, Christ was an expert at using the laws of physics to create powerful changes in people's lives. We are, without a question, aching because we have not discovered the solution to death. In reality, if we think about it hard enough, the only problem or the only powerful energetic barrier we have not solved is death. The only thing wrong with life is death. The fact that we age and die is absolutely no way natural to human beings. We are made different. Animals just live on instinct. Therefore, their potential is restricted. But we have infinite potential. The laws of physics explain that it is so. Our entire human genome and vibrational blueprint testify to these truths. Consider what quantum physics has told us about vibration in connection to the ether or matrix of energy and the constant of particle wave duality. Since particles of energy can become anything upon broadcast, and the fact that even Tesla came to the cognition of such possibility, it means biological eternity already exists in the etheric energy field. It would only take a small amount of people relative to the billions on Earth to change the present reality if they just change their mind to a much positive one. The positive energy, which is much more powerful than any present negative thought, will permeate the entire field. The ether and the energy will continue to send until the tipping point spills onto the field of energy defined by time and space. Interestingly, there is one group of people that is rapidly growing, which, in essence, is introducing this powerful energy into the field. Every day, this energy is exponentially growing, and we are at the edge of its manifestation. This will continue to be discussed throughout the book. With the sort of eternity defining our bodies in eternal youth, our potential then will be really limitless. Consider the thought that we are made in the image of God himself. Or maybe we are sons of the universe whose nature is eternal or infinite. In essence, we are the sons of an eternal God or an inf infinite universe. Therefore, our nature must be infinite. It is not suggested that they are one and the same, but... In connection to both ideas of God or the universe, we therefore must be eternal. Since that is the case, then that is exactly what must happen. Or at least it is what was supposed to happen. What went wrong? Why is that not the case? Let's examine with careful thought what we are talking about here. For as we previously stated, it is absolutely our moral obligation to achieve and align ourselves to the laws 
and the nature of the physical universe. Law of the Universe Achieving Biological Eternity Let's think of the progress of certain technologies. Let's think of money, for example. Money is a tool that facilitates exchange of goods and services. The evolution of money has been demonstrated plainly throughout history. Let's go back to the time of nomads. They moved from one place to another in search of shelter and food. The basics were severely pursued since there were many dangers. Lack of food meant sickness and death. Nomads would become easy prey to other animals. Thus, the pressures of living made them think of solutions. How to stay in one place to conserve energy. Farming was the solution. It helped them establish their livelihoods in one place and produce food without using as much energy as they would hunting. Potential life risk was drastically reduced. The exchange of energy was lower. Thus, people live more abundantly. The land then certainly produced better and more abundantly than the availability of eatable animals themselves. The new economic system made humans progress more exponentially than the old system did. That is not where it stopped, though. Since people have more animals, bread, vegetables, or fruits than they could eat, systems of trading were naturally developed. People have more time to learn, to make clothing, or to create tools for construction. People have more time to learn how to build homes or farm better, manage fields and workers better. All exchanges of energy were more efficient through the exchange of products and services. People were trading eggs for flour, cows for sheep, food for clothing. People helped to build homes or plant farms or vineyards for a rate of exchange, among other benefits. As a result, this helped people establish villages, towns, cities, countries, and empires. Life pressures, though, continue to influence people's minds. People desire and continue to desire to have more time in their lives and the energy to enjoy the fruit of their labors. We wish to experience life better faster and longer. We hate to delay the gratification of our lives. It really is our driving force in nature. We want more and better of the good things life has to offer. But a question does arise. How did gold and silver and other precious metals come into play as a form of exchange or money? Certainly metals are better for construction and we hear of overlaying things with gold and silver but what was the real value other than the observed beauty? This is a good question since we are considering the past. But let's continue observing the natural evolution of money as the need for better and more convenient exchange forms continue to arise. Because of the perceived value, people started to use gold, silver, and bronze to exchange for other goods. There were some issues. Carrying and traveling with heavy bags full of money for the purpose of trading was dangerous and costly. People could get cheated, robbed, kidnapped, or killed. It was also inconvenient to do large exchanges, since you had to carry large amounts of gold or silver to acquire property, animals, or other products that may have been in demand. It was inconvenient to store, and it took up large amounts of space and was costly to guard or protect. People's greed has been known to get the better of them and have caused them to kill people or pillage cities for such things. Thus, the banking system came into play. As we see it today, the exchange form is more convenient than ever before. From a society that used mostly cash with notes backed by gold or silver, we are now a society that uses mostly electronic notes in the form of debit cards, credit cards, and internet transactions. Electronic currencies of money are the rule today. It is noteworthy how the word currency and money are used as synonyms. It is all considered legal tender based on debt, borrowing from the future and living now. There's much debate as to the legalities and the morality of the use of such monies today. Maybe it is so. 
Considering the high interest rates and taxes and other forms of creating money out of thin air may constitute a visible negative outcome in people's lives, mainly different forms of slavery. But here's an interesting dichotomy. Let's imagine for a second and put ourselves in a position that may seem very stressful and full of anxiety. People who experience such things have been known to take their lives and those of their loved ones with the thought that it would be better to not experience the pain. We feel for such people. Either way, let's consider that an average man with a job of $60,000 a year has a mortgage, car payments, kids' college education, his own college education, credit card, or insecure debt with high interest rates put in pressure. He's well off in his 50s. His health is waning. His energy levels are depleted. He's tired of the rat race. This is considered the normal life, the American dream. And maybe he's happy or content with his daily routine and he's looking forward to retirement. But then we hear that he loses his job. Advancing years, his position is unnecessary and easily replaced by technology or younger adults who will take the job for much lower pay. The company downsized or it went bankrupt. Whatever the reason, he now has to draw from his savings and retirement accounts, racks up more credit card debt with high interest rates, and maybe sells his house or foreclosure. The pressure of just providing for the basic necessities of his family is getting to him. He feels humiliated, unappreciated. He is at an all-time low. He becomes desperate because he sees no way out and decides to kill himself. Obviously, this can happen to anybody. We may feel strongly about this man's situation. We could be in a similar situation right now. But do we realize that by just adding one in magic ingredient, his entire perspective changes? With this one ingredient, even if his situation was worse, it will not matter he would still feel happy and excited about his life, probably more than ever before. How? What magical ingredient is that? Nikola Tesla said it, eternal youth. No more aging and death. Let's exaggerate his circumstances now. His mortgage is that of 500000 His credit card debt is up to 400000 His collected debt, including his kids' college education and his own student loans, is another $500,000. He's paying massive amounts of interest, so much that all his payments are going to mostly the reduction of applied interest rate. How does he feel about all that now? I believe we can realize that it does not matter. He has life as an infinite resource. He has all the time in the world to pay his debts. Even if his income was significantly lower, it would not matter. It would not change a thing about his feelings towards these seemingly negative experiences. He will be as happy as he could ever be because he knows he can change it whenever he feels like it. His debt is meaningless in the grand scheme of things. He is in full control, knowing he has infinity in his side, biological eternity. It is death that makes us rush. It is the conscious and subconscious awareness that we are going to die that makes us want to live and experience faster than ever before. We would not fret about work, money, or debt because we have eternal life. If people had this reality, would they steal, cheat, or murder? Would they doubt that they could not have abundance or that they could one day become millionaires or billionaires? Would we ever doubt that we would make trillions of dollars, that we can build our dream state, our own piece of paradise on 10 acres of land? Of course, we would accomplish such things and more because this one ingredient changes the entire recipe. It changes everything. The perspective of humanity would shift like a massive earthquake, and nothing would ever be the same. Unfortunately, as of right now, when most of us think of creating a business or lifestyle that makes us feel free and abundant, most people have doubt and disbelief. Why? Because we know we have to exert ourselves and use resources and sacrifice things to create them with the possibility that we will fail. The problem with that is that if we continue to fail, we fear that we are exerting ourselves in vain and we will miss out on enjoying 
the short lives that we have. But if we have eternal youth, biological eternity, does it matter if we fail? Does it matter how many times we fail? We know that we are bound to get what we want at some point as we persevere. Then the answer is obvious. With life as an infinite resource, we could have, be, and do whatsoever we desire without any fear or doubt creeping in. It would be in our nature because infinity is our ultimate resource. No matter how big or how outrageous our dream would be, we know we could make it happen. We would be like gods with powerful creative abilities evolving and getting better throughout infinity. Since it is our nature to have instant gratification, Death will make a human being overstep other people's happiness and possessions. People will steal, cheat, and do things that we consider as immoral. We hear of people raping one another, whether figuratively or literally, just to gratify themselves instantly. Death pervades every aspect of society, for it is not the desire for every aspect of wealth or opulence that it is wrong in itself, but the desire to attain such things regardless of whom we overstep to get there. Fear or false expectations appearing real, the process of thinking about what we don't want to happen literally kills us. If we are constantly in fear of not having what we desire, we may start to envy those who do. Some may start to criticize or condemn those who do in an attempt to take it away from them. We may start to fear that there's not enough for us. Therefore, our instincts of survival will kick in. And like animals, we may prey on others. By the loss of the universe, we must experience exactly what we have done wrong to others. This has been the sad history of mankind. There really is no other reason for such things existing in our lives. This examination of faith in contrast with fear and death in contrast with life is not to make the reader feel hopeless or upset, thinking that there is no way out. There is absolute evidence that these laws of the universe are kicking in to help us get out of the rat race and allow us to jump into what is our actual nature, eternity. This concept will continue to be developed throughout this book. The Bright Future of Humankind For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Let's go back to what we were discussing about the natural evolution of energy as perceived through the example of the progress of money or currency. As we continue to look at and experience what we don't want, an equal and opposite reaction must take place. As Isaac Newton stated, we now know that as we have fear, we tend to define what we do want. This is that opposite reaction. When we are experiencing that which has become out of habit, creating what we don't want, we experience negative feelings, and thus we feel bad most of the time. This is the equal reaction taking place. Thus, it happens many times that we harness the power of the opposite reaction and focus on that creation or goal in our mind of what we truly desire, the opposite of what we are experiencing. We start to experience contrast in our mind's eye. We begin to feel and emote what it would be like and how good it, we will feel once we have the opposite of what we have. Interestingly, this third law of motion continues to affect our thoughts, whether we are moving in one direction or heading to the other side of the spectrum. We become aware of the complete opposite from where we currently realize is our present reality. That is why we may learn of powerful examples of people whose rags to riches stories inspired us. Or we learn of ultra-successful people who fall to the bottom and their worst nightmare becomes a reality. We are either growing or dying. But all the same, it is our choice through the powers of perception that we are able to make the decision that suits us best. So if we are our worst that we have ever been, then we can come to realize how much worse it could become. But equally present is the thought of how it could be better. Or if we are at our best and readily see how it could get better, but then we are also aware that we could lose it all. Our awareness of such possibilities forces us to focus. It forces us to make decisions. 
We cannot stagnate any more than we can defy the laws of physics and wish them away. Even if we try to stand our ground, in reality, we are projecting a frequency based on fear. People defend and protect what they don't want to lose. Therefore, if we choose such a position, the focus of our perception is only in losing it, and thus we get what we think about most of the time. We hear constantly in sports that the best defense is a good offense. Deciding to be on the defense is nothing more than an imaginary wall. We must always remember that according to quantum tunneling, a wall is nothing more than an illusion because the particles trying to get through already exist on the other side of the barrier. It only needs to persist and with ease, these particles will get through. This is good news since what we perceive as insurmountable stationary obstacles are nothing but illusions. Once we decide to get through, then we are through. We already exist on the other side of the seemingly giant wall. And no wonder Jesus said, quote, Truly I say to you that whoever tells this mountain be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but has faith that what he says will happen, he will have it happen. End quote. Taken from Mark eleven twenty three. As such is the reality, let's always decide to advance. This makes me think of a certain scenario that proves this interesting idea. I remember hearing on the news the story of a man of lowly beginnings who won one of the biggest lottery winnings in the history of the country. A news reporter was interviewing the gentleman who had just won what I believe to be over $700 million. She asked him what he would do with the money. His answer, I have no idea. We may have also heard of dot-com billionaires, such as the creators of Google search engine or the creator of Facebook. Seemingly without much effort and in a relatively short time, they became financially ultra-successful. It seems that just like records are meant to be broken, so do people's seemingly incredible achievements will be broken again. There are more billionaires today than before. The process has gone from trying to become a millionaire to trying to become a multimillionaire. And we are starting to realize that more and more people are becoming multi-billionaires. We may see in the future people achieving their first half trillion dollars. The mountains are becoming relatively easier to remove. As we progressively begin to see the world unfold into more prosperity because of this strange phenomena, Maybe at some point we will realize and see the world with most of its problems virtually solved. We also realize the power of dreams and goals once achieved that dreams, in essence, not only benefit those who are achieving them, but benefit those who also come in contact with those individuals' dreams. For example, a woman opening a restaurant may hire about 50 people, and so she creates value for them. They can make money based on her desired outcome of opening a restaurant. Thus, she places food on other people's tables, creates mortgage payments or rent money for the people who work for her. Her dream creates dignity and self-respect for those who benefit from her ability to create jobs from operating a business. That's value creation. Her moral obligation to pursue her dream achieves much good in her community. Her moral obligation helps her show love for neighbor. Maybe through her use of these principles, as she exercises awareness and faith, she may be able to open more and better restaurants. Her dream could expand to that of opening hotels with restaurants all over the world and thus creating massive value for those who need such money-making opportunities. Let's think about it carefully. First, the operating expenses may include the construction of the buildings. This creates jobs for those whose livelihoods depend on their building skills. Once the building is up, the maintenance of the building creates value for those who provide the services required. Maybe there's a lease that needs to be paid. The kitchen appliances and machines do need regular maintenance and may need repairs from time to time. Money must go out a hundred different places to sustain the business, and by law, the owner of such operations must reap the benefits 
with much larger incomes. Whatever our dreams are, we can see powerful benefits being derived from them and for others. Can we see that a world where everyone prospers is unfolding? Where everyone is able to achieve bigger and faster, influencing others and inspiring them to do the same. People will now be able to make a quantum leap where they are no longer living to merely sustain their existence or are living gratification most of the time. This will propel society to progress into the awareness of eradicating illness and disease. With illness and disease virtually gone, people will enjoy prolonged and better quality lives. With everyone living in continuous prosperity, things like war and crime will become a thing of the past, no longer possible in society. The masses will be firmly established on a deep foundation of wisdom and real knowledge, and such negative concepts will no longer fit and cease to be part of people's minds. But it can't stop there. For the next step will be to eradicate death. People now will want to live forever and will exhaust every possible source to achieve it. With their awareness of unlimited potential, the thought of dying will propel to desire with all their might the continuance of their enjoyment of life. Just like Tesla suggested, if enough people can permeate the ether with the idea of immortality, eternal youth, and beauty, and such concepts must become our reality. It is the law. Just like the law of progress has perpetuated technology in our day and continues to progress exponentially, so must the law of progress perpetuate our lives and value creation exponentially. And this is not a process that would take centuries, for it was not too long ago that we had giant radios, giant televisions and computer stereos, VHS machines, and Walkmans, but now these things are drastically different today. All those technologies, while they're popular, now we have smartphones that have integrated all those operations in one device. Everything now fits in a tiny microchip smaller than a penny. As technology unfolds, we see that everything has become more affordable and more efficient. We can realize easily why this exponential growth is taking place. As people observe these gadgets being developed, at first they are not affordable by the average person. This makes us want them even more. But what we create collectively with that desire is the ability to afford them. But those who can presently afford them realize that they could be better. The creators of such gadgets, in turn, know that they can do better as they discover new and better technology and integrate them into tools that expand and improve our everyday lives. Our collective vibration improves everything exponentially. We live better and faster. And so the same evolution and progress must happen with our individual lives. This is in harmony with the text found in the biblical reference. We will now prove that this concept has been continuing to call out since the beginning of our time. Consider some thoughts from the past. Quote, but the meek will possess the earth, and they will find exquisite delight in the abundance of peace. End quote. Taken from Psalms 37 verse 11. Quote, the righteous will possess the earth and will live forever on it. End quote. Taken from Psalms 37 verse 29. Quote, this means everlasting life. They're coming to know you, the only true God and the one who you sent forth, Jesus Christ. End quote. Taken from John 17 verse 3. We wish to observe that these verses denote the idea of the possibility of people gaining biological eternity, eternal youth, or the exquisite delight in the abundance of peace. We must also realize that they emphasize everlasting life on a peaceful, new earthly society. The suggestion of the last text may emphasize that getting to know the mind of God through creation is in essence the way to achieve eternity. The verse suggests that this character, as described as the one sent forth to teach us how, will gain us biological eternity. I feel we are doing exactly just that through the various fields of study, through science, through philosophies, based on laws of physics, and through examples of successful people who have had the physical manifestations from the practical application of those laws. By studying how the universe works and 
what its laws are, we will be able to learn and evolve infinitely. As we unfold knowledge based on our desires to continue to make every instant better in our lives, through empirical evidence, we have examined that our attainment of biological eternity is more than just a probability. Since it is our moral obligation to use the laws of the universe to improve our lives and by connection, everyone's lives, the ultimate result based on what we discuss is nothing more but the fulfillment of the law of the universe, infinity. God's desire to share infinite eternity. This is evident through what we learn in the creation account. God had created in his power a garden called Eden. The first human couple was to replicate this foundation throughout the earth. To create a global paradise was the purpose of the supposedly first human couple. Whether we personally believe this as an allegory or illustrative story, we cannot deny that through the empirical evidence we are examining the same outcome. We can see both in the allegory and the reality of our lives that the desire for life eternal is a common denominator and a driving force in human nature. This emphasis of eternity was established since the beginning. The account describes a second tree called the tree of life. As to the nature of the tree, it is believed that once the couple partook of its fruits, it would allow them to continue sustaining their lives for all eternity. The one called Jesus in the Bible seems to have been sent forth to correct our thinking of life and how it works. But how can we possibly replicate the quantum miracles he performed? From feeding thousands with only a few fish and pieces of bread to eliminating illness and disease in an instant. What about the seemingly easy ability to bring the dead back to life? Certainly, we have been able to do some good through technology and the progress of science, but not to that extent. Have we considered our observation of what is possible and achievable helps us to believe that we can do the same? Like a millionaire considering the idea of being a billionaire. A billionaire considering the idea of becoming a multi-billionaire. What others have done, we can also do. Considering what Jesus did as it relates to reality and the laws of quantum physics, must imprint in our minds that we can exercise our power of transmission of energy and frequency to affect our reality for the betterment of ourselves and mankind. If we come to that realization, are we not in fact fulfilling Nikola Tesla's vision? Our creative process will open the solution to immortality and eternal youth and beauty. This new knowledge must permeate the ether and it must come back to us by law. And if you really think about it, it is already happening. Consider what Jesus said about those who take seriously the things he did and thus put effort to replicate. Quote, Most truly I say to you, whoever exercises faith in me will also do works that I do, and he will do works greater than these. End quote. John chapter 14 verse 12. Let's examine this suggestion in the light of the laws of physics. If we readily accept the outlandish things that he did as real, then we have no choice but to broadcast a collective frequency of energy that will create them as probabilities in the ether, the field of particle wave duality. But even if you consider them as myth, they must still be created. What you focus on expands, whether or not you believe it as real. Albert Einstein said that the most powerful force in our hand has something to do with our imagination. So as we consider things to be myth or reality, the laws of physics will expand and make them a reality eventually. We should consider that we must take baby steps and progressively move toward the final threshold, biological eternity. Its evolution, as we have discussed, will continue to unfold exponentially, for that which is vibrating must attract more of it. Through the law of magnetic attraction, the field must reach its tipping point and thus spill into the realm of particles defined in time and space. It must become our present reality. It is the law. Can we see now what it is, our moral obligation, to think positively, to speak positively, to act positively? to have positive habits, and to develop a positive character? 
because ultimately it truly creates our destinies. Whether we choose fear with death as the payment or faith with biological eternity as our reward, it is the law and it must take place one way or another. Achieving what we want does mean life and death by definition. It is not religious bias. It is not religious dogma or stubbornness. It is not philosophy. It is the law of the universe as observed by our empirical science and quantum physics. It is as pervasive as the law of gravity. We must choose to create positively or negatively. We must choose either faith or fear, either life or death. And so, ultimately, the collective energy of the masses must either perpetuate the current state of affairs, or will we dare to dream as big as Nikola Tesla did when he called for the removal of the current, inexorable agents that prevent the mass from changing to that of eternal beauty and biological immortality? The Matrix of the Universe Quote, only the existence of the field of force can account for the motions of the bodies as observed, and its assumption dispenses with space curvature. All literature on this subject is futile and destined to oblivion, so are all attempts to explain the workings of the universe without recognizing the existence of the ether and the indispensable function it plays in the phenomena. My second discovery was of a physical truth of the greatest importance. As I have searched the entire scientific records in more than half a dozen languages for a long time without finding the least anticipation, I consider myself the original discoverer of this truth, which can be expressed by the statement, there is no energy in matter other than that received from the environment, end quote, by Nikola Tesla. Quote, what has been is what will be. And what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one may say, look at this, it is new. It already existed from long ago. It already existed before our time. Whatever happens has already happened. And what is to come has already been. End quote. Taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verses 9 through 10. And chapter 3, verse 15. As of right now, the reader may be either just entertained or just plain annoyed by the amount of information that is being compared in connection to the outcomes that have been suggested as probabilities of life. They sound ridiculous, impossible, science fiction. We may hear constantly opposing views about what we supposedly know as facts and truths. There is no right or wrong as to how we feel in regard to knowledge and the input of knowledge. It is what it is. Just like due process in the core systems of the world must be unbiased and never one-sided, in the same manner we must consider objectively all information that may completely oppose what we consider to know to be the truth. It's fine to have beliefs. As long as we are ready to let them go, in the light of new and factual empirical evidence. We may find that our foundational principles that we live out and perpetually conceive will either easily collapse in the light of new knowledge or it may reinforce them. Either way, both outcomes are good. Justice calls for it and we must be better for it. Going back to the conclusion of the last chapter, a reference was made to a famous scene from the first movie of the Matrix trilogy. The Wachowskis have given us incredible parallels of the workings of the universe in one powerful illustration, the movies. If the reader has not watched the trilogy, you are certainly encouraged to at least watch the first one. If you have watched it, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. Just like you may consider the story of Moses to be fictitious and just an illustration, then consider this trilogy under the same guise, an illustration. It will certainly help you grasp many of the concepts described so far on the pages of this book. Note that it will not be the only reference that will be suggested for inclusion in our library of information to help us grasp such concepts. The Ether and the Matrix of Reality 
You may consider that using a science fiction movie as a knowledge source may be going too far. Consider that the suggestion to rewatch the series was given to me by a very well known New York Times bestselling author. It's a great reference material to learn and imprint such concepts in our mind. Did I mention that he has made billions of dollars throughout his career? I would say that, in a sense, he has what we want, and he deems the movie worthy of our time and examination. Since such is the case, I personally would take that suggestion as a command. In The Matrix, the main character, Neo, finds himself going through some weird circumstances and events and he begins to feel confused about what is happening to him. He finally meets the one he has been searching for all along to get answers, Morpheus. He explains to him, the matrix, or ether as such, quote, the matrix is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church. When you pay your taxes, it is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. End quote. Here are some simple but very accurate descriptions of what we have been talking about. The energetic field of particle wave duality, although not the same as the ether, it will be referred to in connection with the realm of energetic waves not defined in time and space. What we must understand is how it relates to us in relation with our collective vibration of frequency and the power of our minds. It is the ether as referred to by Nikola Tesla, a connection with the field of pure energy that permeates all matter or the field of force. This is the matrix or ether it has a powerful influence, and it is radically pervasive like the air we breathe or the water we drink. It is like the law of gravity. It is always there even though we do not think about it, but its effects are instantly discernible. Another factor that runs parallel to Morpheus' explanation is that we are slaves to the matrix. The context in which he describes neo-slavery in the movie is obviously negative. We must realize that just a superficial scan of this information may completely force people to deny that the knowledge we have discussed to this point, it may seem we have but little evidence when compared or contrasted with the mirror realities of most people. For if we have such unfathomable ability and power, why are lives full of drudgery and struggle? But consider that in reality, they seem to prove that we have been hopelessly enslaved. We may wonder, if we are so powerful that we can move mountains with just our thought, how come our lives are full of misery and pain? Our lives are defined by drudgery and monotony. Our lives are defined by the ability to supersede one pain with another. It is an obvious decline towards its sad outcome, death. People seem to just be existing from one event to the next, just finding the next quick fix to distract them from the current pain. People are slaves to their most basic necessities, just barely being able to pay for their mortgages, taxes, insurance, and credit card payments, among other bills, while they try to find some comfort in the company of those who live under the same matrix reality. Spiritual leader Paul commented, quote, but the creation was subject to futility, not by its own will, but through the one who subjected it, on the basis of hope that the creation itself will also be set free from enslavement to corruption and have the glorious freedom of the children of God, end quote, taken from Romans 8.20. We see here strong evidence of those who have been called avatars or powerful people who have influenced drastically the world. In this case, Paul and Nikola Tesla having similar thoughts, just different frames of mind. The point that needs to be emphasized regarding the ether or the matrix is that it cannot be either good or bad. This may contradict the previous idea that we are nothing but slaves to it. But consider the idea of how the movie emphasized a program called The Construct. The movie defines it as a software program where individuals are connected to. 
Their minds are, in essence, hacked into as if they were computers. And then they will receive a download of pictures, which translated to their awareness as being placed inside the computer program. The scene is famous for Morpheus plainly showing Neo what the literal matrix was and how it connected to people's minds. Quote, what is real? How do you define real? If you are talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. End quote. He explained this to Neil while they are in what seems to be a blank three-dimensional space. Nothing surrounds them until all of a sudden, out of nowhere, two red chairs and a TV popped up in their midst. This is later emphasized in a different scene. After defiantly breaking the laws that govern that universe during a sparring session, Morpheus calls for the jump program. Suddenly, Tank, the computer program operator who is in control of what they were hacked into, downloads in an instant an entirely different scenario. The environment changes. They are now in completely different clothing and are standing on top of a building. This, although exaggerated, or is it really, is not far from the truth. It cannot be emphasized how beneficial it will be to watch or rewatch these movies and other recommended selections that will help us to come to powerful cognition. When individually or collectively we are creating or formulating a new thought or the same thought, we establish that at a quantum level, a frequency is simultaneously being broadcasted and permeating all time and space. Its consistency of transmission will determine how quickly it will manifest into our present and immediate reality. This applies to us individually or collectively at every level of connection. As individuals, we transmit a collective frequency based on our entire lives. As families, we transmit collective frequencies. As communities, we transmit collective frequencies. As states or countries, we collectively transmit frequencies. As countries and continents, we transmit collective frequencies. Finally, as a whole, the planet transmits a collection of frequencies that by law of magnetic attraction must come back and effect and show up in our present reality. Here are the questions. Since we are vibrating 24-7, what kind of feedback are we getting in return and why? Who is or what is bringing it back into our experience? Consider this. In the movie The Matrix, the ether first and foremost, is a blank space of infinity, and there is an operator waiting for our command to fill that blank space based on our transmission. The operator does not question your commands or your requests. He's always taking input based on your frequencies. So what are we asking for? What is our individual and collective vibration commanding the operator to present in our reality? The choice is really up to us. Let's go back to the idea that the ether or matrix of infinite energy is based on exactly that, infinity. Let's go back to the idea that the ether or matrix of infinite energy is based on exactly that, infinity. Then let's consider what King Solomon of ancient Israel said, quote, What has been is what will be, and what has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one may say, Look at this, it is new. It already existed from long ago. It already existed before our time. Whatever happens has already happened. And what is to come has already been. End quote. Taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, and chapter 3, verse 15. Since our thoughts and ideas are created in the ether before its manifestation, it's reflecting our matrix of reality then, in essence, it already existed. It has been done an infinite amount of times. It already happened. Quantum tunneling proves that this is the case. Just like the particles were already on the other side, therefore, your transmission of frequency was already in existence and its blank space of infinite energy. It just has to spill over once it reaches the tipping point. 
These concepts may already have been described in previous chapters, but it is re-emphasized here from a different point of view for posterity. What posterity? That we are being influenced by the transmission of others 24-7, both collectively and individually. The more people involved, the more powerful the influence on our thoughts and collective vibration. The implication and consequences cannot be overstated. This is of utmost relevance to our creative abilities. Why? Because as we quoted earlier, no one is more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. This is in reference to the energetic concept and the physical laws that Tesla emphasized, which prevent immortality, eternal youth, and beauty. A biological eternity and eternal youth and beauty already exist in the ether and it is panting or calling out to us as individuals and groups. And it must happen. This also suggests that it already exists in our present matrix of reality, that its manifestations have existed and will continue to exist for all eternity. The challenge is that they exist somewhere else, not here, obviously. We must align ourselves to that present reality so that we get that reality. We must match and mirror the nature of infinity. We must become infinite or nothing. We must live in faith or in fear. The more we exercise our abilities to think, speak, and act in harmony with that desire and reality, the consequence then must be that of a collective transmission broadcasted by those who accept the program. The energy will continue to be picked up by other brains and thus influence the brain transmission of others. The output will influence and push forward much like the snowball effect, in that instead of continuing to perpetuate thoughts of fear and doubt, we will continue to perpetuate and influence the masses to think of that reality, one of faith and prosperity. We have previously talked about how our thoughts will affect the structure of water and completely change its molecular structure. Our brain transmission, along with our collective transmission, is permeating our reality and mirroring back to us the nature of those thoughts. Consider another experiment that is described in a book called The 100 Monkey Syndrome. In this book, it is described that a group of scientists were studying a species of monkeys in a group of islands. There was no way to get from one island to another other than by boat. So they pick one island, and on that island, one scientist decided to take a sweet potato, wash it in the river, and then eat it. A monkey observed the scientist do this repeatedly for a time, and the monkey decided to do the same. The monkey grabbed a sweet potato, washed it, and then ate it, mirroring exactly what the scientist did. After some time, all the monkeys on the island started to copy these actions. The scientists then decided to go to the other islands and saw that all the other monkeys were doing the exact same thing. They were all replicating the process that the first scientist had started. The dilemma is that the scientists did this on one island only. There was also no way for the monkey to just become an Olympic swimmer, make its way to the other islands, and teach this process to the other monkeys. They call this the hundredth monkey phenomenon. They deduce that the collective consciousness of the family on the one island that first observed the one scientist wash and eat the sweet potato, on the one island that first observed the one scientist wash and eat the sweet potato, permeated the ether and affected the consciousness of those other monkeys on the other islands and whispered to them to do the same thing. Brains do transmit and receive energy, frequency, and vibration, thus affect physical matter. The information have reached the tipping point, and it started to permeate the minds of those monkeys relatively close to the first island. It is the same idea with humans, our family and our home. We must take these concepts into serious consideration and completely change the paradigm of a negative and toxic corrupt society into that which goal is to positively achieve 
individual and collected goals, dreams, and desires. Or at least, could we just consider it just like that monkey thought about for a while, whether it should replicate what it was observing this human doing with the potato? Can we just consider it? Pretend what it would be like if it were the case? What would we do, have, or be if life eternal was the only reality? We would build our dream home. We would drive our dream car. We would master every musical instrument possible. We would master every language. We would master every craft and art. We would become master engineers or architects or rocket scientists. Will we discover time travel? Will we be able to travel at the speed of light or much faster than that? Will we discover the ability to transmit things, including ourselves, anywhere else in the universe in an instant? Will we make the earth into a global paradise of happy, fulfilled people? Will we discover other planets and create or replicate paradise in such places far away from home? With infinity and with our imaginations as the main foundational forces, our commanding and creative power will shift our realities. What could we have, be, or do then? What society will we be able to have? I believe we will be able to feel the reality of the words in these verses. Quote, And he will wipe out every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither mourning, nor outcry, nor pain be any more. The former things have passed away. End quote. Taken from Revelation chapter 21 verse 4. Quote, For evil men will be done away with. Just a little while longer, and the wicked will be no more. He will look at where they were, and they will not be there. But the meek will possess the earth, and they will find exquisite delight in the abundance of peace. The righteous will possess the earth, and they will live forever upon it. End quote. Taken from Psalms 37, verses 9 through 11, and verse 29. Quote, Happy are the mild temper, since they will inherit the earth. End quote. Taken from Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Can we see the big picture? Tying it all together. We have examined laws of physics as they have been discovered and how they relate to our lives as a group and as individuals. We also observe how they are connected to all matter in the universe, including our own essence. We have also learned the implications and ramifications of applying such laws in our lives through the power of our brain, frequency transmissions. We have learned of our creative ability and how it is based on either faith or fear. In a powerful conclusion, we notice that our personal awareness and realization of these facts and their practical application can either create death for us or eventually biological eternity. This is expressed by Nikola Tesla. It is the discovery of immortality, eternal youth, and beauty that humanity desperately needs. Parallel to Tesla's comment, spiritual leader Paul expressed the same sentiment. Quote, But we know that all creation keeps on groaning together and being in pain together until now. End quote. Taken from Romans chapter 8 verse 22. As such is the case, it must be our moral obligation to get there individually and collectively as a race. We must create a global paradise. It is the will of God and the universe. It is our law. I will go as far as to say that there is no choice concerning the following biblical reference from King Solomon. Quote, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has even put eternity in their heart. Yet mankind will never find out the work that the true God has made from start to finish. End quote. Taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. This concept creates questions. What can we do from this point forward? What is the best course of action that we can take to expedite the process and get what we want? What can we think, say, and do to influence our ultimate success as individuals and as a group? What habits can we form so as to progressively develop a strong character? How can we grow as individuals and live these concepts 24-7 so that we may create faster and better? Consider this next logical step. Since all of this will continue to be developed in the next chapters, please continue reading 
regardless of whether you have now agreed 100% with everything or not. Our inability to deny the least of the physical laws of the universe gives us the moral obligation to do so. At least consider it as a small suggestion. The choice is up to you, life or stagnation. You may find that you will come to the realization that the matrix of knowledge and creation is at your mental fingertips. <laughs>